In this video I'm going to be covering the effect of material density variations on megavolted photon beam dose distributions. Both the density and the atomic composition of a material can affect the way radiation interacts inside it. The density affects a linear attenuation coefficient, so the number of photons that interact per centimeter travel in the medium, and also the electron range since the electron stopping power varies with density too. Varying atomic composition has a more complicated effect on dose distributions. It affects things like the mass attenuation coefficient or the mass stopping power things that depend on the atomic composition but not the density. When a treatment planning system accounts for all of these variables, it's said to be calculating dose to medium. This deserves special attention, and I'm going to cover this in a future tutorial. But for now, I'm just going to be covering the effects of density on dose distributions. When a treatment planning system accounts only for density and not atomic composition, it's said to be calculating in terms of dose to water. Most treatment planning systems in the past have calculated only in terms of dose to water meaning that they ignore the atomic composition of different materials like bone inside a patient and assume that it's the same as water. Pencil beam dose calculation algorithms and anything older use this approach. They account for the effects of density on dose distributions, but they don't always do it accurately in all cases, as I'm going to describe over the next few slides. Dose to medium is becoming more relevant though, since newer generation algorithms like Monte Carlo and linear Boltzmann transport equation based planning systems often calculate in terms of dose to medium instead of dose to water. If you look through the textbooks and literature, the effect of low-density heterogeneity such as lung on dose distributions, you'll see that PDD curves can look quite a bit different depending on the situation. Sometimes you just see a slight difference in dose gradient within the lung region. Sometimes you also see drops in dose inside the lung to varying degrees. It can be a bit confusing if you're trying to answer a seemingly simple question, like what does lung do to this PDD curve? And the answer to that question would be, it depends. What you can reliably assume is that if you measure a PDD curve in water with no lung present, and compare it with one measure with a slab of lung within the beam, just above the lung, the PDD curves will look pretty much the same. And on the other side of the lung, the dose is higher than it would be at the same depth if there was no lung present. This is because there's less attenuation of the beam inside the lung region because it's lower density. So there's more of the beam left on the other side. And as a result, quite often you'll also simply see a slight reduction in the dose gradient inside the lung, since the rate of dose drop-off is reduced. You might wonder, why isn't there always a lower dose inside the lung region? If there's less attenuation in the lung, it makes sense that there'd be fewer electrons produced since there'd be fewer photons interacting. And remember, the amount of dose inside a region is proportional to the number of electrons passing through it. You might think, if there are fewer electrons, wouldn't there be less dose? This is frequently not the case. Remember that each point receives most of its dose from electrons produced in irradiated areas around it. If every point within secondary electron range of this point is being irradiated, it will receive full dose. In lung, yes, there are fewer electrons being produced, but because the electron range is longer, more electrons can reach this point from further away. So the effect of decreased electron production on the dose is cancelled out by the increase in electron range. That explains why we sometimes don't see any drop in dose inside lung. Now let's look at why we sometimes do. In lower density materials, electron production is lower. This is often balanced out by an increase in electron range. This is only an even balance if all of the material within an electron range of a point is being irradiated. If the beam moves from a high density medium into a lower density medium, the electron range increases. And a beam that might irradiate enough area to give full dose to a point in water might be too small to do the same for a point in lung. This results in a reduced dose inside lung. Since we see here, not all points that are able to contribute dose to this point are being irradiated, so it will miss out on some dose. This happens when the beam size is too small to provide full dose, or lateral electronic equilibrium as it's called. If in a beam like this one, we have lateral electronic equilibrium in water, but not in lung, we'll see a dip in dose inside the lung region, like this one here. This loss of electronic equilibrium is something that we tend to see in high energy beams moving through low density media, because as the energy increases, the electron range increases, and therefore so does the size of the beam that we need to use in order to provide full dose. The same is true when material density decreases as well. As the density decreases further, the electron range increases, and therefore so does the size of the beam required to provide equilibrium. As a rough guide, a 6 mV beam passing through lung, which has a density of roughly a third that of water, needs a field size with a radius of about 3 cm in order to provide full equilibrium, and an 18 mV beam passing through lung needs a field size of about 5 cm. As beam energy increases or density decreases below the point required for equilibrium, this drop in dose is more and more significant. Older generation dose calculation algorithms like pencil beam convolution weren't able to predict the effects of the loss of equilibrium on dose. 
So they'd show a PDD curve closer to what we'd see with this dotted line here. In reality, what happens is that the drop in dose begins just before the proximal tissue boundary as points begin to lose dose due to loss of lateral electronic equilibrium. And there's a rebuildup effect across the distal boundary as lateral electronic equilibrium is re-established. If you're treating a tumor inside lung, these build down and rebuild up effects could have quite a significant clinical impact since they can result in underdosing of the tumor border. The fact that this underdosing will become worse with a high energy beam and because all the dose calculation algorithms simply wouldn't show it are probably the reasons behind the old axiom, don't treat lung tumors with high energy photon beams. These days, more modern algorithms like superposition based algorithms are quite capable of predicting this drop and rebuild up. So if you're using an algorithm that's capable of accurately modeling this effect, and you're happy with the dose distribution, there's really no reason why you can't use whatever beam energy you want. Let's have a closer look at what can happen at the interfaces between high and low density materials. Let's take this example, in which a field size is big enough to produce lateral electronic equilibrium in water, but not in lung. My drawings here are quite approximated, but as we get closer and closer to the proximal water-lung interface, points just before the boundary start to receive some of their dose from irradiated points in lung. There'll be a point just short of the interface, which is just far enough away from the lung boundary to receive full dose, so it will still be in equilibrium, even though it's getting some of its dose from lung. But moving just a little bit closer to the boundary, we see that this point would need a little bit of dose from outside of the field in order to maintain equilibrium. So equilibrium is lost, and the dose is slightly reduced. Moving a little bit further from the boundary, the point is receiving more of its dose from the lung region, less from the water. And we see that even more of the area inside the electron range is not being radiated, so the dose drops a little bit more. So what we see is just before the boundary the dose begins to drop, as equilibrium is slowly lost, we get what's called a build-down effect until a little bit of distance past the interface where full disequilibrium begins. This distance should be around about equal to the electron range of the material. In fact, that's a general rule for effects like these seen in material interfaces. Rapid changes in dose, like a build-down and a build-up effect, only occur within the electron range. Before or afterwards, things tend to change much more gradually. We see a similar thing at the distal boundary, there'd be a point just short of the interface that would be in full disequilibrium even though it's drawing some of its dose from the water region. But moving just a little bit closer, the region inside the electron range that's not being irradiated is reduced, and this point draws a greater proportion of its dose from within the water region, which is in equilibrium, until eventually we reach a point on the other side of the boundary, where none of the region inside the electron range within lung falls outside of the field, so the point is in equilibrium once again, and the beam resumes its normal dose falling. This is why we see a rebuild-up effect across this boundary. The reverse of everything I've just said is also true for high-density heterogeneities like bone. Since the density of bone is higher, the electron range is shorter. So if a field is big enough to produce equilibrium in water, it will also be big enough to do the same in bone. Comparing a PDD measured in a circumstance like this with one measured in a water phantom without any bone present, proximal to the bone, the PDD curves are the same, and this time we see a greater attenuation of the beam inside the bone. So the dose falls off more rapidly with a higher gradient. And on the other side, there's less of the beam remaining. So there's less dose at these depths than there would be if there was no bone. Small field sizes can also have some strange effects in the presence of bone. Except this time, making a field very narrow will cause a loss of equilibrium at a larger field size in water than it will in bone. This is the opposite of what we see in lung, in which the field size required for equilibrium is larger than that in water. So if a field size is small enough to lose equilibrium in water, equilibrium can be regained as the beam enters bone. So to compare with curves measured using bigger field sizes, in purple here I'll draw an unnormalized curve. That just means that the curve hasn't been set so that it reads 100% at the depth of maximum dose, or Dmax. The dose is reduced in the water region because of lost electronic equilibrium, but there's a rapid buildup across the boundary, and just past the electron range inside the bone, the dose is very similar to what it would be if the water was also in equilibrium, as it was when I drew the light blue curve. Most of the time in the literature you'll be presented with curves that have been normalized to Dmax. So if the purple curve was normalized to Dmax, it would look a bit like this green one. So you see a rapid relative increase in dose inside the bone. The unnormalized curve is a bit more representative of reality, since in this case we have lost dose in water, and the dose in bone should be relatively normal. So to summarize, when you have a low density heterogeneity, a high beam energy, and a small field size, you run the risk of losing electronic equilibrium. But when you have a high density heterogeneity, a high energy beam, and a small field size, you can have a rapid re-establishment of electronic equilibrium instead. But when you have a field size that's big enough for the beam energy and density being considered, the effect isn't very pronounced. It mostly presents as a different rate of attenuation inside the heterogeneity. Once again, this explanation applies to density variations only.
When taking material composition into account, there are some other variables that need to be considered too. They'll be covered in a separate video. I've just talked quite a bit about the effect of density on PDD curves. It's also worth having a discussion about the effect on beam profiles. If the field size is bigger than the electron range, points in the center of the field will be in lateral electronic equilibrium, but points within one electron range of the beam edge will be missing some dose because points outside of the beam aren't producing any electrons. Points in the middle of the beam will receive full dose. Points that are inside the beam but within an electron range of the beam edge will receive a slightly lower dose, and this dose reduction will be larger for points that are closer to the edge of the beam. Points just outside of the beam will still receive some dose. If they're within one electron range of the beam edge, they'll still receive some dose from irradiated points inside the beam due to electrons traveling past the beam edge. This loss of lateral electronic equilibrium at the beam edge is largely responsible for the shape of the beam penumbra. If we draw a profile here with the beam edge marked in blue and the lateral electron range either side marked in red, we see that the dose starts to increase at around about one electron range from the beam edge. But it doesn't stop increasing until one electron range inside the beam edge. And the middle region is roughly flat, since it's in lateral electronic equilibrium, it receives full dose. This region here, within one electron range inside the beam, receives a lower dose because it's not receiving any dose from outside of the beam because the points there are not being irradiated. And dose in this region here is largely due to electrons generated inside the beam that are able to reach points just outside of the beam. So the size of the penumbra here depends a great deal on the electron range. And remember, in lung, this electron range is greatly increased. This means that lateral electronic equilibrium will start to be lost a greater distance from the beam edge. And it also means that secondary electrons generated inside the beam can travel a greater distance outside of the edge of the beam. So the beam penumbra tends to be wider in lung. In bone, the electron range is reduced. So the distance from the edge of the beam at which we start to lose dose is reduced. And secondary electrons can't travel as far in the bone, so they tend to deposit their dose closer to the edge of the beam. So in higher density materials like bone, the penumbra tends to be narrower. 